Welcome to Money 201, Planning and Investing. This is a seminar that was originally given at the Toronto Public Library with Sandy Martin and myself, John Robertson. I'll just be giving my part for the web here. So Money 101 would be where you learn how to live within your means, what debt is, what interest is, how to stay out of debt, things like automation and paying yourself first so that you have some kind of savings. And now that you have money to invest, Let's move on to Money 201, Planning and Investing. Now Sandy would have given the first half of this talk talking about planning and I'm going to skip right ahead to investing. So what is investing, why is it important, and how do we do it? I'm sure you're all familiar with the fable of the ant and the grasshopper where all summer long the ant goes and saves up his food, puts it away so that he can live through the winter, whereas the grasshopper kind of fiddles away his time and then when winter comes he doesn't have a big pile of food and either has to rely on the ant to bail him out or die depending on how horrible the version of the tale is. The thing is, just saving what you have doesn't get you too far because if you're only putting away a little bit of what you have, you have to put away a huge proportion of what you have in order to make it through. The ant has to save about half of his harvest in order to make it through the next winter because that food isn't growing on its own while it's in storage. So without investing, Every dollar you want to spend, you have to save first, with the exception of what you get from government benefits like CPP and OAS, which leads to these very high savings rates. And this, of course, gets worse as you're talking about saving later in life and living longer. So when you look at someone who might have 100 years ago been working from the day and possibly saving from the day that they were 20 and retiring and only having 10 years of life or so in retirement, then simply saving got them quite a long ways to a comfortable retirement. If we're talking about somebody now who's done undergrad and then maybe going back for a master's and then taking a number of years to pay off the debt from those degrees and then doesn't start saving till they're about 35, they've only got about 30 years to save before their traditional 65 uh, retirement age. And then if they live to 95, which is what ideally you want to be planning for, that's 30 years of retirement. So you've got an even split of saving years and spending years. So you have to have a very high savings rate if you want to be able to have a comfortable retirement. So to get over this, you need growth from investing to get back down to reasonable savings rates. So growth comes from investing. You get these compounding returns. You're familiar with compound interest. Well, it's the same idea, just it's not necessarily simply interest. And investing is where you're going to be beating inflation because that's the other key thing that comes in. Even if you're in a savings account where you're getting interest, usually that's only pacing inflation. So when you look at what your money's actually going to buy you down the road in retirement, even though you have more dollars, it's not actually buying you any more stuff in retirement. And of course, you also need to meet your future cash flow needs with the rarity of pensions these days and the stinginess of government benefits, you need to invest on your own to make it. Government benefits are there to make sure that people aren't starving and homeless in retirement, but many people strive for a retirement that is more than simply not starving and not homeless. So if you want to travel, if you want to do all these aspirational things that people would like to do in their retirement, you have to fund it yourself with saving and investing unless you happen to have a generous pension. Now, of course, people on the whole don't invest very much. Part of it is because it's boring and they don't have interest, and that's okay. It, it's okay to have things that are boring. You just need to sit down and learn about it and then get it set up, and you can ignore it for the most part. They think it's something for professionals. Well, I'm going to show you in this that it's not, that you can do it yourself, and you don't need to have a professional do it for you to outsource to them, which means you also don't need to wait until you have a huge pile of money to hire a professional to do it for you. You can do it from when you first get out of debt from your schooling or when you're first starting to save money. As soon as you get a couple hundred bucks or a couple thousand bucks, you will be able to start investing. No time? Well, I'm going to show you that it takes very little time to actually get investing. Maybe a weekend or two devoted to learning about it in the first place. So, you know, the no time excuse works for everything from not joining a basketball team to not working out to whatever, including not investing. Uh, so that's not really a strong one here. Don't know how? Again, you have to learn. We're going to show you a little bit here in this talk. 
Afraid of risk. That we're going to have to talk about. Risk is a very real thing, but being afraid of risk should not stop you from investing. You just need to understand it, be prepared to deal with it and to manage it, and to minimize it as much as you can. That there's math and spreadsheets involved. Investing is often looks suspiciously like math. The math involved is very simple, actually. Some people will go off about standard deviations and derivatives and what have you, but really all you need is percentages, a little bit of division, and you can get your way through investing on your own. Confusing a new vocabulary. Again, a decent introduction and a book will help you get through this. There is going to be a tiny bit of a learning curve in terms of learning new words like equities, but it's not that bad. And lack of confidence. Once you see how easy it is, I'm sure that your confidence will build. Now there's the unfortunate gambling analogy that follows around investing. If we go back in the day, Pascal and Fermat had a friend with a gambling problem, and they went to these two math geniuses, well, to Pascal first, to try to solve it. And the math of probability and risk has looked to games a chance ever since, because this math developed to solve problems in the field of gambling, and it deals with uncertainty, it deals with risk, and uncertainty and risk are features of investing as well and so the same kind of math applies there and so often there are comparisons and people will talk about bets and in investing and that sort of thing but investing is not gambling despite the common elements and the comparisons there is risk there is uncertainty now my definition to distinguish between the two is that with gambling you hope for a gain in the short term whereas with investing you expect a gain over the long term you understand that with gambling, even though you hope for a gain, you want, there is a high chance that you will not make any money. The house generally wins. With investing, you may have a loss, but there's a high chance of having more money down the road than you would uh, otherwise. So with gambling, you're doing it only for a short term, because if you keep doing it over and over, you expect to lose. With investing, it's the opposite. You may lose in the short term, but if you keep doing it and holding on for the long term, you expect that you're most likely going to have more money. So what can you invest in? Basically, businesses. You buy a partial ownership of a business. This is an equity, what they call it. You have equity or ownership of that business, also called stocks or the, the shares of that business. Now, this is going to be your risky or growth stuff where the profits from your businesses that you own, those little slivers of shares of whether it's a multinational like Coca-Cola or Microsoft or the small little uh, Canadian businesses, you're going to have that little share and that's going to be the more risky and gross stuff because businesses go out of business and bankrupt and cut their dividends all the time, but a lot of them also make money, make grow and go from little startup companies with couple dozen people working out of somebody's basement into massive multinational corporations worth billions and billions of dollars and if you own a little sliver of that then you're going to go along for the ride there's also interest bearing or fixed income investments things like bonds and gic's that you may be familiar with and this is what we call our safe stuff and generally you're going to want a mix of both risky and safe stuff and they generate returns in different ways they can provide interest payments, and that's for both bonds, GICs, as well as businesses. Some businesses, as part of their business model, provide interest payments. That's a pretty rare thing. For the most part, businesses, instead, are providing dividends, where they're paying out a sh portion of their uh, earnings to the owners of the business, which is you if you're owning the shares, as a dividend. So that's a cash payment that comes to you on top of owning the shares. There's capital gains where the value of the shares increases. And then there's other payments like return of capital that I don't really want to get into because they're a little more rare and, and not as important. So equities, this part ownership of a business. Again, equity, stock, shares, we're basically talking about the same thing when we use these different words. So use them interchangeably. A key thing when you're trying to buy an equity or part of a business is considering how much is this business worth? It's a very difficult question to say, how much is Coca-Cola worth? They sell so many millions of liters of cola and fruit juice and water in a bottle and trying to think of how much that's worth. You can think about profit margins and the expenses that go into it and their growth. And the prices fluctuate constantly because everyone's trying to anticipate these different changes and they have different weightings to what it's going to look like and they're looking at the future growth. And 
that leads to a lot of volatility, a lot of changes in price over time. But fortunately, you don't need to value each business yourself. You can buy a huge swath of the economy, own hundreds or thousands of different slices of businesses, and it's all going to average out. And you're not going to need to worry about trying to look at whether one business has great growth prospects or not, and whether it's better growth prospects than what people are pricing it at. These questions you can learn less ignore by broadly diversifying. And a way to do that is through mutual funds. These are collections of stocks and bonds. They provide the advantage of scale and ease of use. You can go and buy a single mutual fund and give you exposure to hundreds or thousands of stocks or bonds. And of course, diversification in one easy go. A subset of mutual funds are exchange traded funds. So these are mutual funds that are bought and sold over a public stock exchange like the Toronto Stock Exchange or one of the American exchanges. With an exchange traded fund, you usually have to pay a commission to buy it, but their ongoing fees are much lower. So the fees are usually referred to as the management expense ratio or MER. So that's something to keep in mind when you see this acronym pop up again. MER, that means fees. So indexes are large, well-diversified collections of stocks or bonds, and there's a number of indexes that are out there. And these are originally used to benchmark or to compare the performance of different mutual funds against. So you could say, well, if I was to randomly take 500 of the largest companies in the US, is my mutual fund of selected US companies doing better or worse than that? How good is my manager, etc.? cetera? Uh, but now you can actually invest in the indexes themselves through mutual funds that just mimic these indexes. So in Canada, we have the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSX Index. TSX Composite is the one that you'll most likely want to think of. That's approximately 240 of the largest companies in Canada. In the U.S., the two to think about for equities are the S&P 500, which is approximately 500 companies. Despite the name, it's not exactly 500. Or the Total Stock Market Index, which is closer to 5,000 companies, big and small. In the international space, there's a number of different indexes. The one that uh, I'm going to talk about the most and think you should concentrate on is the EFI index or the Europe, Australia, and Far East index. There's also bond indices. So the common one here in Canada is the universe bond index, which is a combination of government and corporate bonds of high quality. So this is going to be your safe stuff. And we can think of these indexes as the average return. If all the mutual funds and all the individual investors are buying and selling different stocks, on average, they're going to get the return of the index. So with the index funds, we can invest in these passive indexes, or we can invest in passive index funds, which track these indices passively. And because they're not trying to pick stocks, they're not hiring analysts to do research, they have a very low cost. And the great thing about index funds is the power of I don't know. You don't have to try to predict or pick winners. You just invest in the index and average it all out. Just take advantage of that. It really reduces your stress and really makes it easy to get started. Index funds are self-directed, though, because you're not going into a branch where there's going to be a salesperson making a commission off of these index funds to help guide you through and make your purchase happen for you, where all you do is hand over a check. Uh, you are going to have to put in a little bit more work yourself, but it's not really all that hard. And again, I'm going to show you what it looks like towards the end of this talk. The huge advantage of index funds is that they are low cost. They're just tracking the standardized set of uh, stocks or bonds and not trying to get fancy with it. And all they're focusing on is cutting their costs. And that's their main competition with each other. Now, I keep mentioning costs and fees. And the importance of fees is really, really stark when you look out over the long term. If you look at a typical mutual fund in Canada with uh, equities in it, you're looking at a fee of about 2.4%. And you think 2.4% doesn't sound that high. But when you look out over the long term, that's 2.4% every year when you're only expecting to make kind of 6 to 8-ish percent. So they're taking a third to a quarter of your total returns just in their fees then it starts to sound really big. And you compound that out over 30, 35 years, and what you see is that the effect of fees is to take away about half of your overall expected return. So here I've got three different lines of the same index just modeled using different fees, with no fees in the dotted line. And the reason I put this in a dotted line 
is because there's never zero fees. You can't escape fees entirely, but you can really reduce your fees and get investing with low fees. And so that's the bold line, a half percent MER fund, a typical mutual fund, uh, index mutual fund or ETF that you might be able to find fairly easily at something like TDE series or any one of the Vanguard or iShares or BMO uh, exchange traded funds. You can, you can hit this bold line of a half percent and you see that the fees do eat away from your theoretical return but that was only theoretical anyway you were never in real life going to get that dotted line return now if you look at what a two and a half percent mer fund costs you which is quite typical in canada for many bank funds and uh, of the major fund companies where you have an advisor sitting with you that's eating up half your returns and an important dis thing to talk about here is the active versus passive debate. Net of fees, passive index funds beat the average index fund, the average active fund, sorry. It's important to remember that some active funds outperform, but most don't. And so if you're talking with someone whose job it is to sell you active funds, they will bring this up a lot, that they have funds that will beat index funds and say, well, why not come and try to do better? The thing is only about 22% of Canadian funds, 12% of international funds, and 14% of US funds did actually beat their indexes over five years ended 2013. So most of these funds are not beating their index net of fees. So they're trying to and failing at it. Whereas if you just bought the index fund, you would be doing better than most of those active investors. And of course, there is no reliable way to pick the 10 to 20% or so of active funds that will outperform in advance. So in other words, sure, you can look at past performance and say, oh yeah, that fund beat, but unless you have a time machine, you can't go back and invest in that. And past performance, as they say in all the ads, does not guarantee future performance. So just because a fund outperformed in the past does not make it any more likely than about that 20 some percent odds of success in the first place of outperforming in the future. So there's a conclusion from this Morningstar report that fees are the most dependable predictor of importance. So fees are the easiest thing for you to control. You can see them in advance on the prospectus of the fund. You can look them up online and they're the most predictable, per, most dependable predictor of performance. So focus on fees, control what you can control, which is fees, and let the rest work itself out. Don't bother trying to pick individual managers, individual funds, individual stocks, just broadly diversify with the index and control those fees. So now I wanna talk about products versus accounts or fruits versus baskets if you wanna think about it that way. So accounts are our baskets where we put things into. And there are a number of different accounts out there. There's your non-registered account and this, account, this covers just about everything. So you can have a non-registered mutual funds account, a non-registered brokerage account, and non-registered just means that it's a taxable account. So you have to pay tax on any gains. And a regular savings account, a regular checking account is also a non-registered account. We just don't tend to think of it that way or call it that explicitly, but it's the same sort of idea and all you're putting into a checking account is cash and that's the product. So the other major accounts to think of are the tax-free savings account or TFSA, the RRSP or Registered Retirement Savings Plan, the RESP, Registered Education Savings Plan, as well as a few others, the RDSP, the Lira, the RRIF, uh, that are similar in that they have some sort of tax advantage and they're registered, but they can hold the same sorts of things. These products, the mutual funds, the GICs, cash, ETFs, stocks, bonds, and of course cash is a product, so you can put it into one of these different accounts. So you can set up an account at your brokerage that's a non-registered. You can also set up a sub-account for TFSA and one for RRSP, and each of those can hold mutual funds or index funds or ETFs or cash uh, or GICs, and uh, the tax treatment of them will be different within each of those little baskets, but they can each hold the same thing. So let's talk about the RRSP first. It's one of the most commonly known about and used retirement plans, uh, tax advantaged plans, and that's largely because it's the oldest. And you put in pre-tax money, which means that if you're putting in money that you've already had tax taken off of because you've saved it up from your paycheck over the year, you then get a tax deduction at the end of the year when you file your taxes. There's an individual limit for everyone because it depends on how much you made in the previous year. 
as well as your own pension contributions. So it's a little bit complicated that way. Basically, if you want to find out how much RRSP contribution room you have, what your limit is, you have to look it up for yourself. Your investments inside grow tax-free until you decide to start taking them out, most likely in retirement. But you can also take out money anytime. It doesn't have to be in retirement. The trick is withdrawals get tax as income and you lose the contribution room, which means you really don't want to be withdrawing from this before retirement unless you're in a really low income year for some reason, like you lost your job or you're on mat leave or you're going back to school or something. Uh, when you turn 71, you have to convert it to an RRIF, Registered Retirement Income Fund, where you have a forced withdrawal schedule. So at least your money in there will start coming out according to a minimum withdrawal schedule. So then it starts getting taxed. And the main thing is that you get tax arbitrage from this withdrawals, taxes, income, but you put pre-tax money in. If you're in a high tax bracket when you contribute and a low tax bracket when you pull money out, you're going to be able to pocket that difference. There is a limited ability to withdraw without paying tax or losing room through the home buyer's plan and lifelong learning plan. So I want to look at this kind of visually, and here we see how income tax works as kind of a bucket. So if you imagine filling up from the bottom, your first $10,000 or so of income is not taxed at all. So it's all in that teal, uh, light green, take home pay region. And then as you cross the first threshold, that's the first marginal tax rate where you're uh, past the basic exemption, the government's gonna start taking some tax off into that uh, blue teal region, the tax payable. And as you keep filling up that bucket with income, the government's going to take a little bit more. And you'll notice that as you cross over into the next marginal tax rate, they're only taking more money off that extra bit of income. They're not going back and revising all of it. So your total take-home pay, your average tax rate, is not really changing much just as you enter the next tax bracket. And that's a common misconception where people think if they cross into the next tax bracket, it, th that rate applies to everything they've made up to that point. It's not the case. It's this little stepped filling of this bucket, as it were. Now, when you make an RRSP, con RRSP contribution, it's not taxed at the time. So the contribution is tax-free. So I've shown it as this gray, this brown bar all the way across so that there's no tax taken off there. And then you can imagine this coming off of there and going into kind of a parallel dimension called the RRSP where it gets to grow and grow and grow with whatever investments you have until it's time to take it out. So now you're in retirement, you're in a lower tax bracket, you're making less because your base income in retirement is lower from your CPP, OAS, and pension or whatever else you have. So now you withdraw the money, and again with that brown bar, but now that withdrawal counts as taxable income, so the government is taking off that little chunk for taxes. But because your income is lower, you're getting to keep more of it, and that's what this tax arbitrage is all about uh, when we're getting into RSPs and earnings versus in your earn, uh, taxes in your earnings years versus taxes in your withdrawal years. The TFSA is newer and it's very simple. Everyone gets the same contribution room every year, currently $5,500 every January 1st for everyone over the age of 18. Money goes in, grows tax-free, and comes out tax-free, but you don't get a deduction on the money that you put in, so you don't get that tax refund. It's very, very flexible. If you want to withdraw, you withdraw tax-free, and you get the room back the following year if you do have to withdraw. Only the ins and outs count towards your contribution room. So whatever happens inside is like a black box. Your money can grow or you can lose money uh, in investments if you're unlucky in there. And the government doesn't care. All that matters for your TFSA contribution room is how much you have in there, how much it grows, how much, sorry, how much you put in there, how much you take out. The rest doesn't matter. Your RESP, that's money goes in and grows tax-free. And the government provides a top up about 20%, although it's more for lower income people. So it's 20% for up to a threshold and then uh, that's it for matching from the government. But if you're lower income, it's an even greater match. The money is, the gains are taxed in the hands of the student when they're withdrawn. And because kids are in a low tax rate when they're students, this means it's effectively tax free or very low tax. So you're gonna get a bit of tax arbitrage there too, just like you would for the RRSP. 
And if you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure if my kids are going to go to post-secondary education, so I don't know if this is really the thing for me, about 80% of kids will enroll in post-secondary or apprenticeships. And I just want to mention apprenticeships because the RESP is eligible for more than just traditional university education. It's college, it's apprenticeships, it's a number of trade schools, etc. Uh, and the key word here is also enroll. If you're thinking, no, no, John, uh, there aren't 80% of kids with post-secondary educations, it's because all you need to do is enroll to be able to start taking the money out of your RESP. If you go to university and drop out in the second year, uh, you still got to take the money out essentially tax-free or tax in the hands of the students. So it can make sense to contribute to an RESP if you've got a kid and think that they might be going to college and you would like to pay for that. If you're not going to pay for it no matter what, then and the kid's going to be on their own, then you know that's your own decision to make. So the big debate is often between the RRSP and the TFSA. And it's an unending debate. You see it crop up every year around this time when it's uh, tax season, RSP contribution season. Uh, the thing is, you get a tax refund for the RRSP, which is really attractive to a lot of people. But it also has means-tested clawbacks. So when you're taking the money out of retirement, you can lose your guaranteed income supplement or your old age security if your income gets to a certain threshold, and those RSP withdrawals count towards that threshold. The TFSA is really, really flexible, which is a perk in my mind, but flexibility cuts both ways. If you don't have the uh, control over yourself to leave the money into retirement as you planned and take it out to spend on a vacation or a new car or whatever along the way, then maybe it would have been better in the RRSP where it's a little more locked down. So in theory, this is kind of how the comparison works. In the RSP, you're contributing pre-tax money, so you could contribute, let's say, $1,667 to get a $667 refund come tax time, which means you net $1,000 after tax in terms of your contribution. Or you could just contribute $1,000 after tax to your TFSA, you don't get a refund, so it doesn't matter. Now let's say that the money inside of these shelters, you've invested it somehow, and it doubles over some period of time. So your $1,667 uh, $1, grows to $3,334, whereas your TFSA $1,000 grows to $2,000. Now you're in retirement and you withdraw. TFSA, very simple, you withdraw $2,000, pay new ta no tax, so you have $2,000 to spend in retirement. Whereas with the RSP, you withdraw $3,334. You're assuming that you're in the same tax bracket, so you pay $1,334 in tax, the same 40% tax bracket, which leaves you with $2,000 to spend in retirement. They're very equal if you're in the same tax bracket in earning years and spending years. However, typically, that for that refund doesn't happen and people don't contribute pre-tax money. Instead, they have a thousand dollars sitting in their hands or in their checking account and saying, "Okay, I would like to invest this one thousand dollars for retirement. Which plan should I go with?" So rather than having more money to contribute to the RSP, they've just got the thousand dollars. So the TFSA on the right is going to be the same as we just went through on before, but now on the RSP side, you've only got $1,000. You're going to get a $400 refund from that contribution. And instead of taking that refund and contributing it to the RSP to try to top it up to get to the point where it matches the TFSA, because instead that $400 gets spent. And I'm not necessarily saying that spending money is bad, but if you're coming in with the plan that this thousand dollars is for retirement and then you forget about that come the time that your tax refund arrives then you're not actually saving that thousand dollars and so this is where the behavioral factor comes in now you've only got a thousand dollars in your rsp it doubles again as we assume to two thousand you withdraw your two thousand in your uh spending years you pay eight hundred dollars in tax in it and you only have twelve hundred to spend in retirement you get all angry, you write a letter to the editor about how RRSPs are scams and the government is taxing the hard-earned savings of retirees, when really it was came down to the fact that the refund was spent instead of going into the RSP, and you would have been better off just putting it into the TFSA if that's what you're going to do with it. So this behavior matters. If on February 24th, you all wanted to go to, you have some money and you want it all to go towards savings, that's great, but by May 2nd, when your refund comes in, you may have forgotten about that, or the determination may have faded, and the refund gets spent. So one way to think about this is, would you take $400 that you have now and spend it 
and only contribute $600 to the TFSA. And a lot of people might say, no, I've got $1,000 for saving for retirement. I saved that hard. I'm not just going to blow it on a new phone or whatever. But this is equivalent mathematically to only contributing $1,000 to your RSP and then spending the refund. But it seems very different behaviorally because you're spending the refund much later, and it's not the money that you have sitting in your hands for saving. It's money that came as a refund. And of course, you spend tax refunds. That's what you do with them. So if you have to consider this, if you're saying, yes, I would contribute the refund, or yes, I would top up my contribution to get to that pre-tax level, then the TFSA and RSP are very comparable. If you're not, I think the TFSA is the better way to go. So here is my very simple rule of thumb on how to save. First, take tax free money. Uh, take free money. So if you have RSP matching through your work, take that first, no matter what. Then contribute to TFSA first. And RSP, RESP is good for kids too. Now I say TFSA first because if you're in a low income uh profile if you're making in the lowest income range you're likely going to get gis when you retire and you don't want to have your money in an rrsp because your gis benefits are going to get clawed back if you're in a higher income while you're working where the rsp is most likely going to be really beneficial to you you could be maxing out both so you contribute to your tfsa first and then you have more savings and then you contribute to them to the RS rrsp and then you max that out too, well then you got the RSP maxed out, which you wanted to do anyway. And then if you're in the middle where it's kind of a toss up as to which one's better, then well, the TFSA first, you don't have to worry about the behavioral rules. And if you then sit down and you are ready to move beyond just a simple rule of thumb that somebody gave you in a presentation on YouTube and look at your own individual situation, if you decide that yes, the RRSP is better for me, you can take the money out of the TFSA completely free of penalty and contribute it to the RSP at that point after you've had a chance to do your analysis. But if you just need a rule of thumb to get started, start with the TFSA. Oh. E. Oh, risk. It's a four letter word. There is risk in everything. I want to make that clear. GICs, bond stocks, everything has risk, but this risk comes on different time scales. So for GICs, they are guaranteed by the government up to a certain point, $100,000 per account, per person, per institution. You will get your principal and the interest that you're contracted for back. But that's only over the short term. The buying power of that principal and that interest could be greatly eroded over the longer term by inflation if all you're investing is is GICs. Bonds, you might get enough interest to beat inflation, but then you have other risks. As interest rates change, the amount that you're able to pull immediately from your bonds changes too. If interest rates go up, you might not be able to pull all of your principal out of your bonds right away. And stocks, well, everyone knows stocks are risky. Come on, they go up and down. And what you might make in a GIC in a year, a stock could lose in a day. But over the longer term, stocks are your best bet for beating inflation and ha preserving your purchasing power. So there's risk in everything. And the way to try to manage it is diversification. Diversify across a large number of stocks, but also have some bonds, some safe cash, and some stocks to meet your goals. And exactly what combination you need is going to depend on your plan. I also want to mention the familiar familiarity and the dangers of it. Things that we think we know, we tend not to think of as being risky. So houses and savings accounts, we know very well, and we tend to think of them as perfectly safe. But they're not necessarily all that much safer than stocks and bonds, even though we're less familiar with stocks and bonds, depending on what time scale we're talking about. To give you an analogy, people are often afraid of flying and not at all afraid of driving. When I was giving this talk in Toronto, at the Toronto Public Library branch, I had to hop in my car and drive there for a half hour before I got there, drive home for a half hour. I didn't even think twice about jumping in my car and driving, even though I do sometimes still think twice about flying, because flying makes me uncomfortable and nervous. Yet we know from statistics that flying is the safer way to travel. It's only because we're so familiar with driving and familiar with cars that we are forget that there's all these accidents all the time on the road, that cars go off the road and crash or bump into each other, and people die. 
and you're more likely to die traveling by car than by plane. But because we travel by car every day, it doesn't seem risky. So there's a difference between seeming risky and actually being risky, and familiarity really can cloud our minds. So try to think about this objectively. Risk tolerance is very important when you're coming up with your plan, and it touches on your ability to take on risk, which means do you have backup plans? Do you have something to fall on if your investment doesn't work out or whatever risk it is? Do you have flexibility? Do you have the willingness to take on risk? Can you control your emotions to stick through it? And do you have the time factor to get through it? So as an example, if I want to save up for a house down payment, I'm 35, I'd like to buy a house around the time I'm, let's say, 40. Uh, that's a short time period. That's five years from now. So should I be putting my down payment fund into stocks? Well, a simple rule of thumb just looking at time would say no. But I can look at my risk tolerance and say, sure, I could take on a fair bit of equity risk because I have the flexibility and the backup options. I would like to buy a house when I'm 40, but I don't have to. I can wait till I'm 45 or 50. So if there does happen to be a market downturn at the time that I'm looking to take that money out of the stocks, I can just wait it out, give it time to recover. I also have flexibility. I might be thinking that I've got this pile of money that would become a nice 30% down payment on a house. But if it's, if I have less money for my down payment because stocks go down, I could just put less down. I could put down a 15% down payment. That risk of the stocks going down doesn't translate into life risk for me. It doesn't interrupt my ability to buy a house. I can still buy a house. I just put less down. And I have backup options. I can buy a cheaper house. I can keep renting. So I think that with my risk tolerance and I have the willingness and I will be able to ride through it and not you know, be suicidal at the time if it happens. So be, with all those factors, I think I can take it on. Now, if instead it was the same five-year time horizon, but I was looking to retire soon, well, I've got the short time, but I have little flexibility. If stocks are down and I'm looking to spend that money for that first year of retirement, and I've got 50% less to spend, I mean, I can't really cut out my rent or if the time property taxes or my food budget or whatnot. Like, I'm already planning to retire and be kind of frugal with it. I can't cut back too much more. I don't have that kind of flexibility to be, oh, well, I've got half as much. I'll still be fine. And I don't really have a backup. I can't go back to work for another five or ten years when I'm planning to retire. Maybe I can, but I can't count on that. I might have a disability. I might be degenerating or my position might not just not be there. So I need to be safer with my investments in that case. So volatility is a big source of risk and a thing that gets talked about a lot when it comes to stocks. And I want you to understand that volatility is a very real issue when you're th thinking about investing in stocks. If you want the money and you need all that money to be there in a short time frame, then stocks are not really for you or for that part of your portfolio. Looking back at the 1987 U.S. stock market crash, Black Monday, stocks lost about 20% in just a couple of days, most of it on the one day. That money was just gone. If you, in July or August, had some money and you put it away into the stock market and wanted to spend it later that fall, maybe to buy Christmas presents, a big portion of it was gone. But if you look on the longer term chart, that played itself out in just a year or so. The same thing with the other recent market crashes we've had. If you have a couple of years, the volatility plays itself out. Over the longer term, yeah, the volatility is there, but it's not such a big issue. If we look at historical year uh, returns over 10-year periods, almost all 10-year periods were positive across these different asset classes over the last 30 years in Canadian dollars. The TSX was positive for all of them, and this is inflation-adjusted real returns. The S&P 500 and the uh, International Index, the EFI, did have a couple of decades where you would have had negative year, uh, yearly returns, as bad as maybe minus 5% a year. And those periods all included the 2008 stock market crash, where you also had, going into that period, the Canadian dollar going up and up, which makes the value of your international investments worth less. 
But still, most of those 10-year periods, you had a positive return and a fairly strong positive return. So if you can wait 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to invest, you're likely going to do quite well investing in equities. Okay, so we've thought about our plan. We've thought about what matters to us. We've thought about our goals and direction. And we've thought about our risk tolerance. So now we're ready to invest. I just want to mention one thing up front, which is robo-advisors, and this is not mentioned in the book, The Value of Simple. They provide automatic index investing, which is great, but they're very new on the market. And of course, the reason that they're not mentioned in the book is because they did not exist at the time that the book was written, and the book only came out a couple of months ago. So they're very new on the market. They're not even available in all provinces yet. They're also not quite as cheap as I would like, but they're not bad. You know, you can get a plan set up that will automatically work for you for about 0.75% or so, depending on your age, how much you have to invest, which company, etc. So Sandy and I have made a comparison tool and see her website to find it. There's the URL on the screen. And now, if you want to do it yourself rather than using a robo-advisor, you can do it cheaper. And there's a couple of great ways to invest in index funds. Here are three that I think hit important milestones or important intersections in the trade-off between how easy it is to invest versus the cost to invest. So Tangerine, formerly ING Direct, is an online bank and they offer a set of mutual funds that are super simple. They are the easiest thing to invest in. They are more expensive. Their MER, the fees, are about 1.07%. Or to put it in dollar terms, if you've got $20,000 to invest, it's going to cost you about $214 a year to invest it with Tangerine. And it's very low effort. You can invest to the last penny. They do automatic rebalancing. Orders are very straightforward. Pre-authorized purchases can be done and set up and very easy to set that up. Now, if you're willing to put in a little bit more work, for less than half the cost, you can go into TDE series. Again, you can invest to the last penny. You just say, I have $522 I'd like to invest. You just throw it at them and they will invest, and you can invest that $522. But you must rebalance, rebalance manually. If you want to split it between Canada, the US, international, as well as some fixed income, you have to make that split yourself and put in the transaction a couple of times. The orders are still fairly straightforward though. You just enter in the fund symbol and the money you have, and you're off to the races. And you can also set up pre-authorized purchases, but now it's a little bit more complicated. You have to get them a call on the phone. To compare, you're looking at $84.50 a year for someone with $20,000 to invest. So that's a fair bit cheaper than Tangerine, but maybe you think, I get value out of that you know, $130 or so dollars uh, to just be able to put it in Tangerine, not have to determine my split myself, just answer a simple risk questionnaire and throw money at them. Or you might say, can I save even more money? In which case you can look at ETFs. And I mentioned Quest Trade here because they offer free purchases, which makes them the cheapest, but you can buy ETFs from any brokerage in Canada and all the big banks have discount brokerages that you can go with. Now the thing with ETFs is you have to invest in whole units. You must rebalance manually. Your orders are more complex. And with Quest Trade in particular, they don't offer cash accounts. You can only get margin accounts. And the reason I mention that is because it's possible with margin accounts, if you're not careful, to take out a loan that you didn't intend to take to borrow, uh, to borrow to invest. The trade off there, though, is that it's even cheaper. It's as cheap as you can get for investing. So you keep more of that money in your pocket to either just save for yourself or to pay for the services that you need if you need to hire someone to do planning for you or hire someone to help you with your budgeting, etc. So I'm going to talk about E-Series for the rest of this talk because it's kind of that nice middle ground between the simplicity but cost of Tangerine and the complexity but cheapness of uh, using ETFs. So it's a good compromise, and you don't need a ton of knowledge to be able to get going. The thing I want to mention very strongly is that TDE Series are self-directed accounts, and the branch staff cannot help you. They are self-directed accounts. And the branch staff cannot help you. This is not a loop in the audio. The branch staff cannot help you. I am repeating it for emphasis. You may go online and find reviews of TDE series where people are quite upset at them. They had a bad experience. And in almost all cases, it is because they tried to go into the branch and have the branch staff help them with something. 
The branch staff may be super nice. They may want to help you with TDE series, but their systems are not set up to enable them to, which just leads to frustration on everyone's part. It's like there's this glass wall in front of TDE series funds in the TD system. So if you go into a branch and try to get someone to help you, it's like their activity just slips off or slides around the TDE series. They can't actually buy them for you. They can't sell them for you. So if you want to go in and say do a home buyer's plan withdrawal from your RSP and you're invested in E-series, the branch staff can't help you with that. So what you need to do before you go into the branch to do your home buyer's plan withdrawal and get your mortgage set up is to transfer your money out of the TDE series into a mutual fund that the branch staff can help you with and then go into the branch. And otherwise all the stuff that you want to do, buying funds, selling funds to spend the money, rebalancing your funds, you're going to have to do yourself. So with that caveat in mind, let's go through it. I'll show you it's not that bad to do it yourself. You just have to keep in mind that you do have to do it yourself. So you want to invest, do it step by step. Step one, asset allocation. You have to determine how you're going to split up your money. How The first step is to think about how you're going to split your stocks or your growthy, risky stuff with your bonds or your safer stuff. And a great rule of thumb that I like is to just take your age and subtract 10 from it. So if I'm 35, I take 10 from that and say I'm going to put 25% in bonds and then the rest I'm going to put into stocks. And now my equities are stocks I want to diversify internationally. And there's no exact precise metric to determine how much to put where. Canada's only about 4% of the global economy, so if I was to split it up by the weighting of our country in terms of its weight overall, I'd put very little into Canada. But on the other hand, I live here and I'm going to be spending Canadian dollars for a large number of my expenses in retirement. And I know Canada and it makes me more comfortable. And if I'm in a non-registered account, it's my investments in Canadian companies are taxed a little more favorably. So that makes me want to put more into Canadian stocks than just 4%. And because there's no exact mechanism for this, I don't want to be 100% Canada. I don't want to be all the way down at 4%. A nice even split is one-third, one-third, one-third. Again, no precision. Figure out what works for you. But one-third, one-third, one-third is what a lot of authors recommend, in part because it's very easy to remember and keep up and rebalance to. And it's good enough, and it's within about the right range where you're currency issues and your diversification issues are nicely balanced. So lots of factors can influence your asset allocation and how you're going to adjust that. If you need to be more conservative in your allocation, more bonds or DICs, you need to expect to adjust your budget and savings to match. So for whatever reason it is, whether it's emotional, whether it's because of your situation, if you have to include more bonds or DICs, then remember to adjust your budget because you're not going to get that long-term growth if you're not including equities. You're going to have to revisit your alloc asset allocation decisions over time uh, as events change. And I don't mean do performance chasing. So as the different asset classes perform differently over time, you're going to have to rebalance back to your plan. But your plan might change because you get disabled, or you get a promotion, or you start getting a defined benefit pension plan, whatever reason it is, revisit it from time to time to make sure that your asset allocation that you set when you happen to watch this video and read the book and get going as a do-yourself investor for the first time actually matches up with your situation in the future. And in order to be able to do this intelligently, I highly recommend that you write down what your asset allocation is as you're getting started here. And write down why you picked it that way, because you don't want to be coming back to this five years later having completely forgotten the reasoning behind, why am I only 25% in bonds? You know, especially if there's been either a really strong or a really weak stock market, that might tempt you to try to, you know, think back and go, oh, I made a total mistake investing that much in the market. I should have been more, it should have been less. Look at your reasoning written down from the time. So you understand why you did it and don't try to adjust your asset allocation just because the market did something. Adjust it because of changes in your life, if you have to. 
So I mentioned rebalancing, and that's going to happen because your allocations in your portfolio will shift relative to your plan as they perform differently. If Canadian stocks go up, but U.S. stocks stay flat, then you're going to have more than a third of your equity portion in Canadian stocks and less than a third in U.S. stocks. And so you'll have to sell a bit of Canadian stocks and buy a bit of U.S. stocks to balance that out or between fixed income and stocks in general, etc. Now, when your portfolio is small relative to the regular purchases or the regular savings that you have going on, you can rebalance with purchases only. It might take a couple of months, but you'll get back to your target just based on buying at your plan or adjusting what you're buying. So you don't necessarily have to sell something to get it. But if you're very out of alignment or your portfolio is very large compared to your savings rate, then you will need to sell something and buy something else to make the rebalancing happen. And rebalance when it makes sense, which means, you know, kind of yearly, every year or so, have a look at it. If you're rebalancing too frequently, you're going to lose out to uh, transaction costs, and it's just going to drive you crazy. But you don't want to leave it forever. Uh, another way is to just set a threshold. If your targets get off by more than 5 10% or so, then rebalance. And when I'm saying 10%, I mean if you're planning on a third and it goes up from 33% to 36%, that's 10% of a third. Uh, or you can just say 5% absolute. So if it goes from 33% to, to 38%, at that point you rebalance. Just set some rational, reasonable target where you're not having to rebalance all the time. So now let's have a look at how this actually plays out, how you're actually going to purchase these mutual funds or ETFs, if you get to it, inside of your account. So we're talking about TDE series, and I'm assuming that you're doing this through TD Waterhouse. You can also purchase TDE series through a TD Mutual Funds account, but I find that the Waterhouse interface and that the help staff are a little bit more useful, so that's one I like to recommend. So once you log into your TD Waterhouse or TD Direct Investing account, all you're going to do is click Order Entry Mutual Funds over on the left menu, and that's going to bring you over to this screen here, your order entry screen. So I've entered a fund code into that large circle, TDB900, and hit get quote circled in the smaller red circle here. That brings up this bar with all the information across the top. And what I'm looking for in particular is the fund name here. I see TD Canadian Index Fund D. That's ex what I'm expecting to see. So when I enter TDB900, I get the TD Canadian Index Fund. I just want to make sure that I haven't made a typo in entering that little fund code. And then I enter the amount I want to buy. In this case, 116.66. I put in this odd number just to show you that you can put in any amount that you want, as long as you're over the minimum, and you will come out able to buy those funds. It doesn't have to be even increments of $100 or whatever it is. You can put in any amount that you want, down to the last penny. Uh, this is not the case for ETFs if you get there. ETFs you have to buy in whole units, and the units are not necessarily whole dollars because they can trade for various pennies. But let's keep focus on the TDE series here. And after I've entered this, it's just a matter of hitting next, agreeing to a few conditions, and moving on. And then I just repeat this four times over for the four different funds I want to buy. So if I've got a bond, a Canadian index, a US index, and an international index, that's four purchases that I'm making. And then I'm done. That's it. It can be this easy. So please don't feel intimidated uh, by going out and doing this on your own. Once you see that it's really just this easy to work it in the brokerage account, you can go off and do this on your own. You don't need to pay someone to be managing these transactions for you. The hard part is coming up with your plan in the first place. Here I've given you a table of some fund codes. You'll also find this in the book, The Value of Simple. Uh, these are the ones you're most likely going to need. So that's it. Now you're ready to be a do-it-yourself investor. You've got a plan. You've created it. It fits your needs, your goals, your direction, and your values. And you've written it down so that in the future when you forget why it was that you decided on one thing versus another, you'll have something there to refresh your memory and even to remember what your plan was in the first place. You've determined what your asset allocation split is going to be, how much risky versus how much safe stuff, and then how much international diversification, maybe something simple like a one-third split for each of the three different categories of uh, equities around the world, maybe something a little bit not quite even. Whatever it is, there's no precision. Find something that's going to work for you. 
Then you've thought about your baskets, where you're going to hold these funds, your TFSA, your RRSP, your RESP, or your non-registered accounts. And you've thought about how you're going to prioritize them. Maybe you've gone with a simple rule of thumb like TFSA first, RRSP second, RESP third. Or maybe you've looked at your own situation and said, oh, the RRSP is optimal for me, so I'm going to put that one first, and only when it's full will I move on to the TFSA, whatever, as long as you've thought about it and written it down. And then you're going to try to automate these things and carry on. Buy, rebalance, lather, rinse, repeat, and the less you have to touch it and think about it consciously, the better. So if you can set up pre-authorized transfers, pre-authorized purchases, that's going to make it a lot easier to stick to your plan and be successful in the end. And then all you have to do is stay on track for a few decades and check in every few years. And then that brings up something I like to call execution risk, which is where you actually manage to follow through on this plan that you came up with. And that's entirely in your court. And that's also where I like the TDE series funds or even the Tangerine mutual funds, because it is a little bit easier to follow through and execute on those than it is with exchange traded funds. Still, an exchange traded fund plan is going to be very simple. Again, Follow whatever works best for you, whatever you like. Remember that the keys to long-term success include simplicity and sticking to your plan. Even if your plan is not completely optimized, you'll probably do better than the next person with an optimized plan if you're actually able to stick to your plan and they're not. And automation plays into that. Think about good enough solutions, things that are going to get you where you need to go without adding extra complication. ETS might be cheaper, but maybe TDE series are... Uh, easier for you to follow and that's good enough. Also consider value for money versus avoiding all costs. You are going to have to pay something to invest in terms of either commission fees, MER, some combination thereof, and maybe even professional advice. If you're paying 2.5% as an MER for an actively managed fund and you're meeting with a salesperson for 20 minutes a year and not getting a detailed plan out of that, you're probably not getting good value for money out of that uh, relationship or the money that you're paying. But maybe you do want someone to look at your plan, in which case paying a planner or an advisor of some sort an upfront transparent fee, maybe you'll get value out of that. Maybe something else will bring you value if you pay for it. For instance, the simplicity of a mutual fund versus an ETF. Whatever it is, just consider the value that you get for the funds for the fees that you're paying, no matter which form that takes. Remember to revisit your plan from time to time, in particular reassessing your risk tolerance, not in light of what the markets are doing, but in light of what your life is doing. And always consider the risk and your risk tolerance for what you're investing in. This was, of course, originally a library talk, so we had closed it out here with some further reading, which I'm happy to let you read off the slide here. Uh, do go out and check Sandy Martin's site at springpersonalfinance.com. Not only will you find out about her services, but you'll also see some of her wonderful blog posts that's there. Uh, my own blog is at holypotato.net, and The Value of Simple is my book, The Practical Guide to Taking the Complexity of Investing. Most of the images and slides that you see here came out of that book, and this is the material that the book focuses on, how to get going as an index investor, how to stick with it, how to report your investment income for taxes, that sort of thing. So you can find out more about the book at valueofsimple.ca. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.